What's up, noobs? Of all the prop tech that's out there, 3D printing for buildings is at the top of my list for its potential to change the industry, and it's one of my medium-term goals to 3D print a single-family home. So naturally, we've researched it to death, and in this video, you will learn everything there is to know about 3D printing buildings up to this point. I am obsessed with 3D printing technology for buildings because to me, it's clearly the next big step in construction. There are plenty of companies out there focusing on modular housing and building houses like cars, but I see that as the hybrid cars of housing. It's just a stepping stone. Because all the modular housing companies we've spoken to don't provide much of a cost savings above traditional methods. It basically shifts traditional construction into a warehouse under controlled conditions. The benefits are typically limited to schedule gains and improved safety, which are valuable but not revolutionary enough for us as developers to make it an obvious option, which is why it's struggled to gain traction. 3D printing, on the other hand, would be revolutionary. Architects would be able to design super complex shapes, and later, AIs would be able to replace those architects to design even more complex shapes that would be structurally optimized and aesthetically... interesting? The amount of required human labor would drop dramatically. Construction schedules would speed up 10x, and the materials can be more environmentally friendly. Anything that offers such a drastic improvement in cost, schedule, and sustainability would be a disruptive innovation. That being said, let me give you a quick history lesson on 3D printing to show you how we got to where the technology is now. The concept of 3D printing, or additive manufacturing, surprisingly wasn't all that far behind 2D inkjet printing, with the first mentions in a science fiction magazine in 1950, and two decades later gaining attention in an act. By the 1980s, things started leaping forward from the magazines to patents being filed for a few different 3D printing methods. The first method was a stereolithography apparatus, or SLA which shoots ultraviolet laser beams under a pool of liquid photosensitive polymer to selectively harden portions of it, one layer at a time. This is the method that looks like the T-1000 rising out of the floor. The second method is called selective laser sintering, which is an upside-down version of SLA using powder instead of a liquid polymer. It shoots laser beams at a flat bed of powder, selectively hardening the areas that the laser hits. Then a platform lowers the object and the powder bed is refreshed for the next layer. The third method is Fused Deposition Modeling, or FDM, also known as Fused Filament Fabrication. That's the technology that extrudes a spool of thermoplastic filament through a printer head mounted on a small gantry system. It moves across an XY plane, extruding heated filament until an entire layer is done. Then the platform with the printed object shifts down on the Z plane to allow the next layer to be printed. Companies formed around these patents, but with the exception of a 3D printed organ in 1999, a whole lot of nothing happened while these companies controlled their patents. Sort of like E-Ink Corporation deciding what applications are commercially viable. Check out my video on color E-Ink screens. By 2009, the Fuse Deposition Modeling, or FDM, patent expired, and with FDM printers dropping in price from $10,000 to $1,000, things really started to pick up. By 2011, students at Southampton University 3D printed a functional unmanned aircraft using selective laser sintering. Core Ecologic created a prototype car called the Irby with a 3D printed body. And in 2012, MakerBot was launched as a Kickstarter project and was bought by Stratasys in 2013 for $400 million. In 2019, pretty much all the patents expired, and companies have been popping up everywhere to advance the technology. So 70 years after being published in a science fiction magazine as a pie-in-the-sky idea, 3D printing is finally beginning to be tapped for its true potential. Obviously, there are countless applications of 3D printing on a small scale, but the benefits will be literally enormous when scaled up for construction. And sure enough, over the last seven years, there have been a handful of companies and researchers in academia pursuing large format 3D printing for buildings. The first reported 3D printed buildings were completed by the world's biggest real estate developer, China. A company called Winsun announced in 2014 that it had 3D printed 10 houses in 24 hours using a mix of cement and construction waste. But nobody really took them seriously because of China's lax building regulations and the rough design quality. To gain some legitimacy, they collaborated with Gensler in 2015 to 3D print the outer shell of a fully functional office of the future in Dubai. In 2016, they faced some literally stiff competition from Hua Shang Teng Da. This two-story, 4,300-square-foot house can withstand an 8.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. So Winsun answered back with a 3D-printed, five-story apartment building. 
That same year, the San Francisco-based Russian company Apiscore made waves by releasing a video showing an actual 3D print of a small one-story house they built in 24 hours. They did it by building a huge version of the FDM method of 3D printing, using fast-drying concrete mortar as a filament. They transported the robotic arm to the construction site and the house was printed in place. The roof and the finishes were constructed using traditional methods after the print. However, as cool as it was at the time, it was still kind of hard to take it seriously because the voiceover guy sounds like he's doing a movie trailer reading a script written by non-native English speakers. Seriously, check it out. It's weird. And so, like Winsun, Apiscore one up themselves and Winsun by printing a much bigger building in Dubai and firing the voiceover guy. They 3D printed a two-story administrative building for the Dubai municipality standing at 30 feet tall with an area of almost 7,000 square feet and they claimed the title of the largest 3D printed building, even though Winsun's was supposedly bigger. Winsun one up them one year later by building the largest 3D printed structure of any kind, a 1,640 foot long wall along the Suzhou River to prevent shoreline erosion. By the way, this was not the first project on the Suzhou River I've mentioned in a video. By 2017, the concept of 3D printing buildings really started picking up steam. University of Nantes built Yenova House in France by 3D printing a foam mold and casting the concrete. The breakthrough with this house was that someone now actually lives in it. In 2018, an Italian 3D printing company called Wasp printed a small home in Italy out of local naturally occurring materials. And Washington University in St. Louis entered the fray in China with their Lotus House using the 3D printed mold technique. Their mold, however, could be reused 100 times and significantly reduces carbon emissions and waste over traditional construction methods. The biggest leap forward that year was actually from a Texas-based company called Icon Build, founded by Jason Ballard, Alex LaRue, and Evan Loomis. They didn't try anything flashy or big. They just built a really small house using a really big 3D printing gantry system for 4,000 bucks and took the title of first 3D printed home in America. What got the media's attention was that they had a real business model behind this, whereas all other homes to this point were just showcasing technology. Icon Build set out to print cheap homes for the homeless in third world countries, and then shoot for the moon. No, literally. They secured a $35 million venture funding round in 2020 and won a NASA contract to design construction systems for future moon missions. Speaking of interplanetary developers, NYC-based AI Space Factory had emerged around the same time, founded by former KPF architects. Shout out to David Mallet, David Rydell, and Michael Bentley. Let's catch up, guys! On the terrestrial side of their business, they approached the market from the luxury end, packing their two-story house design with all sorts of technology and raising money for their first house on Indiegogo. On the extraterrestrial side, they also won a $500,000 NASA award for the 3D printed Mars Habitat Initiative. Their 30-hour print used a biodegradable basalt composite that's stronger than concrete, and it needed almost no human assistance. In 2020, Long Island-based company SQ4D printed the largest permitted home in the US and put it up for sale. You can check out the Zillow listing in the description. So what's next for 3D printing? Well, each of these companies are always pursuing higher print resolutions, meaning thinner layers and smoother surfaces. They're also exploring different print substrates for greater structural integrity and faster print times. Once they can pass certain size, resolution, cost, and structural thresholds, I think it'll trigger a rapid adoption of the technology because of the no-brainer benefits it'll provide. Academia gives us the biggest hints of what's coming. Defab House was an ETH Zurich project combining robotics, 3D printing, digital design, and home automation technologies. So their three-story building showcases an array of different materials and construction techniques, like curved concrete formed from 3D printed molds on one floor, and wood frames arranged by robots into complex geometries on another floor. Looking further ahead, MIT Media Lab's Mediated Matter division is usually light years ahead of commercially viable technology. PhD graduate Stephen Keating did his 2016 thesis on a project where he and a few other master's students built a self-driving robotic crane with six degrees of articulation, which has way more range of motion to print crazy shapes than any of the other companies mentioned before. Link to his thesis defense and paper in the description if you're interested. It's really interesting, and it's also really sad because Keating passed away in 2019 after suffering from a massive brain tumor which he scanned after it was removed, and then he 3D printed it and he handed it out as a business card. MIT Media Lab continues to show us hints of the future with lots of research into robotic swarms. This actually scales down 3D printing, but with the end goal of printing even larger scale structures. Miniature robots can act as tiny 3D printers by climbing or flying over to where they need to extrude some material. Or in this particular project, these are mobile FDM printers weaving fiberglass filaments to create these 15 foot tall tubes. I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to working for our future robot overlords. 
But till then, stay curious, noobs.